Hello and welcome back to Probability Theory, the video course where we talk a lot about random stuff. And with this part 23, we finally start talking about so-called stochastic processes. In fact, here we will first define what we mean by such a random process. However, of course, I will never forget to give a big thank you to all the nice supporters on Steady, here on YouTube or on Patreon. And please visit my website to download the PDF version and the quiz for this video here. Okay, then I would say, let's immediately start with the topic of today, which is stochastic processes. And the good thing here is that you can immediately remember that a stochastic process is not complicated at all. Roughly speaking, it's just random variables in a row. And usually we interpret this as a random experiment with a time evolution. For example, here random variables in a row would mean we have discrete time steps for this random experiment. On the other hand, we could also think of a continuous time flow. It just depends what process we want to model here. So with this, you should immediately see that such stochastic processes are very important in a lot of applications where we have a time evolution. Hence, for example, you can immediately think of a bacteria population growing or simply of a game with dice. So maybe let's immediately start with such a board game so that you can see that the description with a stochastic process is helpful. So let's imagine you have a figure on a board game that moves after throwing a die. This means after the first time step, we have six possibilities for the outcome. And of course, for these possibilities, we know the corresponding probabilities. This means for the next time step, we have to consider all these probabilities and continue the game. Hence, you should see a model with a stochastic process and with discrete time steps can help you to solve this game. However, for a more concrete example, we should look at a much simpler game first. And you might already guess, this could be a coin game where we just have less possibilities. And let's say this is a game you can play alone, so you take a coin and you toss it again and again. And you do this until two successive heads occur. So in some sense this is an infinite game and you just look where the two first heads in a row occur. So this could happen very early in the game, but also maybe never. And of course, as always in this course, we can put probabilities to these events. Therefore, we want to define a random variable x and we put an index n to it. And for us now, this lowercase n is a natural number. So you see, here we have our discrete time steps. Okay, but now the question is, how do we define this random variable xn? So first, we need a fitting sample space omega. And this you might already expect, we have heads and tails as outcomes in a set. However, this is not enough, because we have a whole sequence of coin tosses in this game. Therefore, depending how many coin tosses we have, we need the corresponding power here. And now since we could have infinitely many, I write down the natural numbers. Hence, what you see here now is a short notation for the set of sequences where the entries are either heads or tails. And indeed, this is the correct domain for our random variable, because our sequence could have infinitely many members. Okay, but in addition, we also have the question, what is the codomain of this random variable? Okay, and at this point, our parameter, lowercase n, comes into the game. In fact, it means after n coin tosses, we want to check if we finish the game. If we don't find two successive heads in the first n tosses, we say we have zero. And on the other hand, if we find them, then we say the outcome is two. Okay, but now you also see, I left some space for the middle ground. This is because we obviously have the chance of getting two successive heads in the next round if the current toss is heads. More precisely, this means if we didn't find two successive heads yet, but the nth toss is exactly heads, then we put the outcome to one. We do this strange definition to see that we have some movement between the numbers here. Indeed, what this exactly means, we will see in a few minutes. 
But before we go into more details for this example, I first want to give you the definition of a stochastic process. Now the idea you already know from the example, but now I want to give you the formal definition. So let's write down how we put random variables in a row. So first what we have to fix is an arbitrary set and let's call it t. So it could be any set and often our interpretation is that this is the set of time points. Therefore often we have that t is equal to n or z which correspond to the discrete time steps and on the other hand we can also have the continuous case where t is equal to r. And then as seen before what we have to do is to define a random variable with index lowercase t. So in other words we define a map for each time point in our set t. And now of course all these xt should be defined on the same sample space omega. And in general we would say they map into r or rn. So we have a random variable or even a random vector. And now the only thing we have to do is to put these maps into a sequence. And the short notation would be with parentheses where we put t and t on the index. And now we have it. This object is what we call a stochastic process. And now for a given stochastic process we can also fix a lowercase omega from our sample space. And then we can simply check what happens with this omega over time. In other words we have a map from the time set t into r. And then we can check at each time point t what happens with our omega. This means we simply put it into xt. So you see this could be very nice. It could be a map from r into r again. Now there exist a lot of different names for this nice function but we keep it simple and just call it path. Simply because it gives you a path this omega takes over time. Okay so there we have it. This is the definition of a stochastic process and you immediately recognize it's a very general thing. Therefore let's make it concrete again and let's go back to our nice example from before. So we have infinitely many coin tosses and we check when the first two heads in a row occur. And as before you see it's very helpful to define the three numbers as outcomes 0, 1 and 2. So these are the three possible outcomes for our random variables given by xn. And now we can make the whole thing here into a dynamic picture because if we increase n here we know that we will jump around on these numbers. For example if we are at 0 here we know we didn't reach two consecutive heads yet and we have tails in the current toss. Therefore we have a chance to reach one with the next toss. And indeed this probability is exactly one half because this is the probability to get heads in the next toss. However we also have the probability of one half to stay at the value zero. Okay but this is now everything that can happen when we start at zero. Then for the next step imagine that we are at one. Then we have the chance to reach two with one half of probability. However as before the probability is also one half to fall back to zero. Indeed this arrow here means that we get heads in the next toss and this one means that we get tails. Okay there we have it. This is what can happen if we start at the value one. And now in order to close the case we also have to ask what happens if we start at two. And in fact there we have probability one that we stay at the value two. This is how we have to find the value two. If we already reach two successive heads we don't lose this game anymore. We can continue with the tosses but it will not change the fact that we have already reached two heads in a row. Okay then I would say let's continue with this example in the next video where we will talk more about stochastic processes. So have a nice day and bye bye. Mm -hmm.